Thanks. If you're here, I'm recording. Uh, Titan present, please. All right, um, let's get started. Any questions to begin with? All right, great. Um, well, um, today I wanted to talk to you guys about multicast kind of a fun topic. Um, mm, okay, got to fix the animation on that one. Cool. Um, so thus far, when we talked about um, delivering data in networks, we mostly talked about one-to-one uh, -one forwarding was what we call unicast. So that means sending data. Oh, am I even sharing my screen? No, I'm not. Um, great. I know what I'm doing. I just figured we'd use our imagination today. Yes. <laughs> um, this is back to the days of radio. All right. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, all right. So I want to talk about um, going beyond unicast. So what we talked about thus far is unicast, which is delivering data from of one source to one destination. Um, what other types of data delivery or other modes of data delivery you guys can think of that involves more than one destination? So for multicast? example, when I'm, what's that? Multicast, although I don't multicast. know multicast, but I'm guessing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, multicast, right? Multi being more than one. Perfect. All right. Would so, mind. What's that? Broadcast and geocast. Broadcast and geocast. All right. Someone read the chapter. Excellent. All right. So we have broadcast, we have geocast, we have multicast. We also have any cast. All right. So there's a uh, some ways of forwarding data to more than one destination, but yet we have many of many options. Okay, so when we talk about, uh, we can talk about broadcast, which is one to all, um, and that requires us to define the notion of all. Right, you can think of one uh, of all being all the nodes in the internet or all in some network setup, but um, Kind of the membership class is um, not that specific. It's well, it is very specific, but it literally means all everybody in in some setting. Okay? We can also talk about multicast, which is one to many of a group. Okay? So multicast requires the definition of a group, which is some subset of all. 
Um, and then we can talk about open and closed groups. An open group is a group where you can send data to all the members of a group without being a part of the group. And a closed group means that only group members can send data to all the other members of the group. Um, when you guys take, or some of you, when you'll take distributed systems with me, we'll talk about um, the notion of group membership because the group membership can change over time. And in distributed systems, there's this notion of delivering a message to a group um, only if it gets delivered to one um, to one members of a group. So either you deliver to all or you deliver to none. Okay. Um, in networks, we don't have that level of specificity um, of, of group membership. There's also any cast, which is sending something to any one of a group of people, doesn't matter which one, just one of them, but you have multiple choices um, or the network has multiple choices as to who gets the actual packet. And then you have geocast, which is delivering something to members in an area where the uh, membership is not even specific at the time that the message is sent. Okay, so depending on kind of what makes sense for your application, you may or may not have network support for that type of transmission. And um, so if you need one of those things, you may be relying on application level mechanism, or if you're working in a distributed um, system, such as a, a grid computer, or maybe a cloud environment under certain situations, you can have sort of application layer mechanisms that you can use sort of like very powerful sockets um, that can handle some of that group membership for you. I'm thinking specifically here of um, MPI or message passing interface, which we also talk about in distributed systems. These are not very common scenarios, but um, people did spend a lot of time thinking about how to make um, sort of one to many or one to any um, type traffic be supported in the network efficiently. And we'll look at some of the problems with doing that inefficiently. Yep. So, was, yeah. So in geocast, that would be something like similar to the Hawaii missile warning debacle where they basically, where they sent out the false warning. Would that be geo or would that be, um, I would assume so because it was everybody in Hawaii. Yeah, that would be that would be geocasting. Very good example. Um, or Amber Alerts. Oh yeah, that's true. Right. I mean, we get. I I I haven't seen one when I lived in New York and California, but they seem to be a thing in in Montana. So, um, right, we get those like once a month, probably. Yes, at least, and it always at right. one. Right. So, um, right. Obviously, that's a thing. That's a thing here. Um, so, in the, yep, Michael, I think, go ahead. What about GPS? What about it? I'm pretty sure that's also an example of global cap geocaching. Geocasting. <laughs> it's actually not. Um, GPS satellites actually broadcast to everybody. So the way GPS works at a very high level is you have these satellites with very specific timing maintained among all of them. So they send messages at a particular time. And when you receive a bunch of them, depending on the timing of the arrival of the messages, you can triangulate your distance to these satellites and so your position on, um, on the globe. So you have a bunch of things broadcasting to anybody that might, that might hear. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. That's a good question, though, right? How does GPS work? Um, right, so it's actually um, it's a good example because it's really easy to broadcast in a wireless setting. Right, wireless networks are particularly good at broadcasting because literally that's all they do, unless you have a a, a very directional antenna. Okay, so this idea of delivering something efficiently to multiple users has been um, kind of an interesting problem in networks. So one of the early applications of it that has been commercial um, was the real player. I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Probably not, and it's good for you because this was a terrible system. But it was sort of this early super annoying player that allowed you to, to initially play music through it. Um, but one of the cool things was that this was uh, maybe the first commercial solution that allowed streaming music over, music over internet, right? which was 
a, a new thing. You don't have to download a file to play it. You could just stream it. Um, and they kind of wanted to rely on on uh, multicast, and it just wasn't available in in the networks. It turns out that internet service providers don't really support multicast, and we'll get into why why that is. Um, the Nutella network tried to have um, broadcast um, among its peers. This was an early file sharing network. And because they didn't have network support for multicast, this was very, very inefficient. Well, broadcast in itself is pretty inefficient, but um, Nutella was great until you needed to find something and it just took forever. Those broadcasts really collapsed the bandwidth of the network, so there wasn't much network, much uh, capacity left for actually delivering files. And this was one of the problems solved by um, uh, distributed hash tables. Okay, and then um, Google Meet was um, and still is um, a system that uses AnyCast, meaning that you can uh, to initially connect to it, you send a message to an IP. And you don't really know which server it, it reaches. Um, there are multiple servers listed under the same IP, and the network actually directs your traffic to, um, broadly speaking, the closest one. And so this, this, this does come back periodically. Systems do try to use it. Connecting one to many is a pattern that um, is present in network applications, and there's a bit of a mismatch between the needs of applications and the support for that type of traffic in the network. Um, someone is making some noise. If you could mute, that'd be awesome. Sorry, I was just going to ask. So, I mean, oh, with uh, Zoom and like WebEx and stuff like that, that would also be multicast then? It would also be multicast, but it happens at the application layer. Oh, okay. Um, which means, which, which we'll kind of get to, um, you effectively have to set up a network of servers that does multicast for you at the application layer because networks don't support multicast. If they did, it'd be much easier. It'd be much more efficient to do to support this type of traffic. Okay, interesting. Yeah, good question. Um, one of the early programs that that literally used multicast in the network, and this was one of the first network games because of it, was SGI Dogfight, which I'm sure none of you played, but it was uh, pretty cool. It's basically like the first physics-based flight simulator, um, which was pretty cool if you were. Super nerdy back in early 90s. OK. Um, so this literally used multicast, which is actually the only example that I can think of that, that, that used that protocol. All right, so let's get into um, some of the difficulties with it. So let's say that we have this our, our trusted network example. And um, you want to deliver data from uh, you to all the other nodes. OK. Right now, the only way of doing that would be using multicast, right? We haven't talked about how to do it in any other way. And so you would literally find, set up a transmission to V, to W, to Z, to X, to Y, starting from you. As a result, we have one, two, three, four, five destinations, which means that you would be sending five streams. And it's not clear that you has the capacity to do this, right? Or that more likely, if we think of these as routers, that a client connected to you would have enough capacity to the router you to send that much traffic. Okay. So right now I have uh, how many people are on this call? Uh, not as many as I'd like, but still many more than I could transmit to if I was just trans if I was transmitting a single stream to all of you guys. Right. So that's not going to work. So what could we do? Well, um, we could flood. We could, instead of establishing routes to everybody, I could flood a single packet on all the outgoing links. Okay? So what's the difference? Instead of having someone raise the hand, go ahead. Wouldn't flooding just be a recipe for a security nightmare? How so? I mean, it just, it, it gives me DDoS attack vibes for some reason. <laughs> um, well, so what is DDoS? DDoS is multiple servers uh, sending data to, or sorry, multiple nodes sending data to one server. And there's a lot of incoming traffic, a lot of requests. Yep. That 
a server can must handle and so it doesn't have enough capacity to handle legitimate requests if you are flooding that means you, you still need to send all those messages you can send them you know via multiple paths to, to one destination presumably if you can do some hacking but the the power of the attack is still limited by your up, uh, uplink bandwidth oh okay that makes sense thank you for explaining that. you're welcome yeah so um but your intuition is right that there is lots of traffic being generated now the question is is flooding any better than unicast in unicast a uh, client connected to you would need to send out five different streams to reach the other nodes okay um under flooding a packet or a stream would go out on every outgoing link okay so in this case at you this would be three packets going out or three streams going out um, rather than five so it's an improvement from use perspective okay but flooding is pretty dumb what happens is that let's say that a packet being sent out i'll just talk about a single packet instead of talking about streams just not have to say two things at once um, so we have a packet going from uh, on all the outgoing links of U, and so a packet gets to V. Now V does the same thing, it also floats. So it sends a packet on this link and on that link. As a result, when U sends a packet on this link, it gets retransmitted by V and arrives at X, but U also sends a packet directly to X on its outgoing link, okay? Now X has two arriving packets. Well, a packet also goes to W, which also retransmits it on all its outgoing links, which means there's a packet going to X. And eventually there'll be a packet going to X from Y. Right? So you see that the number of packets in a network gets multiplied by the number of outgoing links on every node, which causes what's called a broadcast storm. Would you also have broadcasting back to itself too? Because all of X's outgoing links would also be coming back to you, or is that covered? Yeah, yeah, that could also happen depending how you're doing it. Uh, okay. um, you could, you could do it in a way where each node only transmits once a particular packet, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't get, there's some limit to it, right? Um, which is basically controlled flooding, right? So, um, there's some sequence number to packets, and therefore each node only when it receives the packet and only forwards it once. Okay, so in flooding, there would be a packet coming from U, X would retransmit it. There'd be a packet coming from U V, X would retransmit it. Okay, under controlled flooding, flooding, X would realize that it already got the packet from U it, and retransmitted it. It doesn't need to retransmit U's packet coming through V. But we need sequence numbers for that. It's not super hard. It's just something that has to happen if you want to control flood. OK. Or you can construct a minimum spanning tree um, where you select some set of links um, that reach all the nodes. Okay, so what would be a good spanning tree? I don't know. Uh, UX, XY, YZ. OK, that's one path. We cover XYZ. And then we have maybe. Um, a, we're also going to add this link from Y to W. That seems like a low cost thing. And then maybe a link from U to V. Okay, so we have this link. Or maybe I can draw. Let's see if I can draw. That'd be awesome. Then, sweet. We have this link, we have this link, this link, this link, and then this link. Okay. And that's our spanning tree. It's a tree that spans all the nodes. Um, all right, so that's cool. Um, it lowers the cost because there's a packet going on each of these links only once. Um, but what are the downsides of this? You would have to know the all of the network to be able to do that, right? Pretty much. You need to you need to either know the network or you need to do some coordination, some something on the control plane of the network um, in order to organize the spanning tree. Right? So now also, there's complexity involved here. It also looks like you could get some congestion in X because you're sending all the data through it to get to all the other, well, almost all the other links except for V. 
or would that be an issue? Maybe not maybe not X, because X only forwards one packet, but Y has to do this extra work now, as does U. Right? There is, there is extra work involved. It's not just forwarding one packet, it's you getting one packet, you're forwarding two. Right? So there's complexity, there's complexity at routers, and um, maybe it's not clear how to account for that traffic. And when you when we talk about ISPs, this is an issue. Let's let's consider let's consider. Do I have a different color? It's getting fancy here. Okay. Let's consider Y to be its own autonomous system. That's it's going to be hard. Okay. <laughs> let's say this is an autonomous system, right? It gets uh, one packet here. Okay. So let's say X is going to pay. Y for forwarding its data, but now Y has to spend kind of its credit twice because it, it, it relies on other networks to get the data delivered. So how is Y making money here? It's basically losing money. From Y's perspective, it would be actually be better to get two packets if it's gonna send it out twice, because then there's a balance between its out, incoming and outgoing traffic. Right? Like a spanning tree sounds like a good thing, but then but then there's all this complexity involved and it's you know, is it worth it? <laughs> all right. Um so let's talk about some methods for spanning tree construction because ultimately even though there is control traffic and complexity around it, um it does save a lot of network traffic, which over long term should be the efficient solution. Okay, so you can do the link state approach, which is basically you know all the network, you know all the links, um, and then you can find some shortest paths, combine them into a tree, and uh, Bob's your uncle. You got your spanning tree. Okay. Um, the other approach is to use a distance vector approach, um, which is basically to um, combine a bunch of unicast tree join messages. So let's say we're going to define, uh, I'll change the color to red. Okay. Let's say we're going to define this as source. Okay. U is going to be our source. Okay. Um, and all the other nodes want to be in this multicast tree. Okay. So V says, okay, I want to forward a message to you because I know you use the source. I'm going to find my shortest path. Okay. Great. So I look into my distance vector. Uh, routing table and I send a message here. Okay. X does the same thing. Okay. And then Y says, yep, I also want to do it. So I'm going to send a message to X to join this tree. X says, well, I'm already part of this tree, so we're good here. Okay. Z does the same thing. And uh, W says, okay, what is my shortest path to the source? Uh, looking at these links, uh, it's this. Okay. And so the tree can become constructed from destinations to the source, assuming that the destinations know where the source is. And they might not know it, maybe it's not gonna be the source, maybe it's gonna be some rendezvous point, like we're gonna decide that, um, we're gonna decide that X is the rendezvous point, and so everybody um, connects to uh, X, so maybe we don't have this link, we have a less efficient link here, Okay, and so now all the nodes are connected using a tree. So anybody in this group can become the source and transmit data into this tree. Okay. So this works pretty well. Um, there's a possibility of links being asymmetric, meaning that they don't have the same bandwidth going in one direction versus the other, and so joining data from sources may not actually be the best path. In this network, we assume that all the links are symmetric, and so that's not an issue. Okay, so let's see how this actually is implemented in the internet, or more likely how it was designed to be implemented in the internet. Okay. So the first challenge is how to identify group members. There are some members of a multicast group and there are many multicast groups in the internet or in some network and some nodes may decide yep i want to participate in um this particular group right and let's say 
um, let's say that just for example, okay, there's a bunch of people that want to participate in SGI dogfight and they know that this particular game is being hosted at this IP address. How they know this? Well, that's a separate question, but uh, they need to learn somehow this IP address. But once they learn it, they can say, yep, I want to participate in a, in a game at this IP address. OK. So once we can identify group members, um, then the question is how to address packets to them and then how to create these uh, multicast spanning trees. So there is this group uh, membership maintenance protocol or group management protocol, internet group management protocol, IGMP, and this protocol runs between the host and the first hub routers. Okay, so if a host wants to participate, it would use IGMP to talk to its first hub routers and say, router and say, hey, yep, I want to be in this group, or you have a client here that is interested in this particular group. These routers would then uh, communicate using the distance vector multi-hub routing protocol to establish um, a uh, spanning tree among themselves. And it's not just these routers that have clients connected to them, it's all the routers that, that participate in this network. Okay. Um, this would be something that can run at the edge. This isn't something really that runs in the internet as a whole. Okay. Um, okay. As I mentioned before, an IP, a, a multicast group would have an IP address, but where does that multicast IP address come from? Okay, turns out that there's a class of IP addresses, class D in this case. We talked about classes A, B, and C, right, with different uh, numbers of hosts in them, but it turns out that there's also a class D, which is a 224 slash four subnet. It's not a real subnet, it's just a group of IP addresses. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of them, right? Because only the first four bits are defined. Okay, so you have 20 bits that are undefined. It's a pretty big address space, but it has to serve all of the internet, right? There's only so many multicast groups that are permitted. Okay. And so packets sent to those should be delivered to all the to all the members. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, we want to create a um, uh, create a spanning tree among these nodes. These are also called Steiner trees. Um, basically, a spanning tree is also called the Steiner tree, and we want this cost to be minimum for all the connecting routers. Unfortunately, this is an NP-complete problem. It's it's not possible to find a minimum cost spanning tree, or there is no algorithm that exists for it. Um, um, Someone said that's why we should be using IPv6. Who said that and why? Why did you say it? I said it. Why did you say it? Because if there are only the class D addresses that can be used, what happens when you run out? You can't. That's a good question. A good question, right? With IPv6, we have we have many more addresses, but um, does it really solve the problem, right? Even if you even if you could use IPv6 addresses or a portion of that space for for addressing hosts, okay? is it the number of flows? Is it the number of multicast groups? How long do they live? Right? You can address all the grains of sand, but um, there are many many flows that are coming and going, so. It's not immediately clear to me that there's even enough of those IP addresses, right? When you're addressing things like devices, those devices stay around. When you're addressing ephem ephemeral things like flows, you know, it's not clear that there would be enough. But it's a good suggestion, right? We could get more addresses from IPv6. I'm just thinking out loud, I guess. I, I like your suggestion. <laughs> um, Some way to fix that problem. <laughs> So, okay, so what we have, um, so what we have is, is we're gonna try to create this tree in a way that's okay, but not perfect, because perfect is not something that, that we can get with this spanning tree problem being complete. Okay. Um, 
so what we're going to do is we're going to create um, um, we're going to control flow the network to announce that there is a that there is a group okay and let's say that this node starts sending traffic okay initially that traffic would be delivered to all the other routers okay? eventually Y figures out that it is not part of this part of this group okay there are no clients connected to it interested in this traffic okay as a result Y takes itself out of this thing it stops forwarding traffic okay but these nodes know that there's a client connected to them clients connected to them for this flow and so they participate right they they keep replying to this tree maintenance okay so basically we end up creating a tree i don't know what's an efficient path here i guess something like this okay it's not perfect you can see it's definitely not the lowest cost but it doesn't involve the routers that are not interested in forwarding that have no business forwarding Um, so there are these prune messages if there are no downstream recipients saying basically take me out of here okay. um, and then basically this state will come out if there's no deliveries then eventually uh, traffic will not be forwarded from x to y now this um, dbmrp will basically figure out the spanning tree within a network or a subnetwork if it's running it but then we want to do it at an internet scale and then what needs to happen is that within a from within a local isp these routers still need to join and it turns out that these messages can be forwarded by bgp among neighboring um, autonomous systems okay. so let me kind of um, summarize this what you need to do is figure out who's in the group okay and then once you know which routers contain messages contain codes that are interested in a multicast group you then need some protocol to figure out multicast spanning tree or close to it and if you're doing this at the internet level you need to uh, incorporate that protocol or the multiple spanning tree to not include just routers but autonomous systems that's the theory <laughs> the funny thing is that this absolutely does not happen in the internet none of this none of this is used okay um the basic the basic issue is that multicast is um just it creates too much complexity at routers it's too infrequently used to for the complexity to make sense it's much better to build routers that basically don't support it they're much faster they're much cheaper to build um and they don't really there's no advantages to handling this really rare case of multicast Furthermore, multicast doesn't make anybody any money, right? Because it's a fairly rare thing and because there's no way to account for it, right? Like an autonomous system can get one packet but have to then forward it five ways. Um, and there's no mechanism to balance that traffic. So even though I'm doing this extra work creating multiple copies of the packet, I have no way to get remunerated for it as if I'm an autonomous system. And so ISPs do not want to support multicast for these reasons. And so even though people have designed this beautiful thing that totally works in theory, it is just completely not used at any scale. Okay, you might see it in some local networks, but not really. So what so about why am I teaching? Why am I teaching you guys this? I'm teaching you this so that if you ever come with an idea of like, you know, it'd be way efficient to do multicast if we just do it at the network level, um, like don't spend your time on it, right? It's a good idea that for practical reasons, it's just not gonna get adopted unless, uh, uh, unless you have an insight that goes beyond um, kind of the knowledge I've been telling you guys. Question. Yeah, so you say it's not like cost effective because there just aren't enough um, services using this, um, but like aren't there like multiplayer video games, for example, is that also at the application layer? Um, yes. or Okay. Absolutely, but but it's not at the application layer in a way that you think. So, what happens, and we'll we'll talk about it um, a little bit later too. But people still need to deliver streams to multiple destinations efficiently. The problem doesn't go away just because ISPs don't want to support that type of traffic. So, what do people do? They build multicast in their own ways. So, if 
you want to deliver a video stream, let's say an NFL football game, right? You're obviously not streaming it individually to all the different households, right? You would contract with an ISP or with a content delivery network. Okay? So ISPs um, will have entire kind of sales branches and entire sets of technologies to enable multicast streams through MPLS, which we'll talk about shortly, um, throughout their networks, right? You, you say, basically, I'm giving you the ISP, this game, stream of a football game at this router, I'm gonna send you the bits, and I would like it to come out at all those other routers. That's, that's, that's what I'm purchasing. And the ISP will figure out internally how to do it. But they're not gonna use multicast, they're gonna use MPLS. Um, someone was annotate shared content. Cool. Okay. All right. If you want to annotate, I guess I started an annotation thing for you. I've added. I have um, no idea what just happened. Okay. Cool. You just requested, I think, a request to annotate the content. That was accidental. Sorry. No worries. No worries. I didn't know this. We'll support it. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so ISPs can set up multicast streams for you, just not just you have to contract with them to do it. And then what they do is not just set up a multicast stream, they set up an, an MPLS uh, spanning tree, and then they also provision it to make sure that it has enough bandwidth for the content that's being sent. And same thing's done for concerts, same thing's being done for UFC, basically any streaming event. You can also contract with a content distribution network, which works a little bit differently. They do have streaming services, but they also have services where um, you can, you know, multiple, multiple people start a stream, but at different times. And what they assume is that there is enough overlap in the interest such that if they cache um, the, the video stream at some node, multiple people will be requesting different chunks of that video, right? And so, um, they effectively build a, a, a multicast network, but it's a multicast network of caches that end up storing the same content. It's just that how the content gets to the caches at the edge is effectively through multicast by, or through multicast in a sense of one-to-many delivery, um, by having a cache at the edge, request something from a cache upstream, which requests something from a cache upstream. And so effectively that builds a multicast and a delivery network by having nodes at the edge request stuff from caches that are more upstream. Yeah, so this, this absolutely exists. It's just supported more commercially than um, in the internet, um, kind of in an open way. All right. Um, Uh, right, I'm stuck in this annotation thing. Okay, moving on. Um, any other questions about multicast? Cool. Okay, so then we get to anycast, which is uh, also a pretty cool thing. So what we have is a client that wants to get some data from a, let's say, content delivery network server. Um, those servers exist in multiple networks. So what the client wants is to just connect to the closest one or one with a good network connection to it. Okay? So what we have is two servers and those servers are connected to the internet, to different autonomous systems, but they both have the same IP address. Weird, huh? We thought that IP addresses were unique. Well, it turns out they don't have to be. So what you end up having is an advertisement of router 1D saying, I can reach uh, 212.21.21.21, okay? So this advertisement gets spread around, and so router 2A gets this advertisement. Well, the same thing happens here. 3B says, oh, cool, looks like I can reach 212.21.21.21. It advertises this thing around too, Right, and it goes through here and here. Okay, and maybe here, but this router already knows it, so it doesn't maybe it maybe doesn't forward it anymore. Okay. 
So from the point of view of 2a, it thinks, oh, cool, I can reach 212.21.21.21 on this link, and I can reach it on this link. Okay? Depending on the policy of AS2, maybe it forwards it to AS4, maybe it forwards it to AS1, right? But effectively, 2a has an advertisement that it, that it has reachability to this IP address, so it forwards it and it forwards it. This would be the same thing if this if CDN server A didn't exist, 212.21.21 would get advertised in this direction as well as in that direction, which means it will get advertised here, 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 and here. So that's basically any cast. You can attach servers with the same IP address and rely on the routing protocols to find an efficient route or to forward packets on an efficient route to one of those. Do requests in, in um, different autonomous systems get confused when they're going back and forth between A and B since they have the same IP address? They don't, it's, it's, just, it's just reachability. Okay, so, so when you have an advertisement for 212.21.21.21, okay? Mm -hmm. This message, uh, let me change the color maybe. Uh, this will be helpful, we'll see. Okay, so this advertisement goes here, okay? And this advertisement goes here. Okay? Mm -hmm. From the point of view of 1A, it says, I can reach the, that IP address on the blue link, okay, on the blue interface, and I can reach it on the green interface. Okay. Right. And then basically it can choose which direction it sends its traffic directed for 21, 21, 21. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I just was unsure if it would ever get confused at any point. But yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense, right? And so I then. Yep, yep, yep. And if you have, um, you know, if you have an advertisement, uh, actually, let me get this different color. Uh, okay, so let's say that this advertisement gets spread around here, right? And we have the blue advertisement going in this direction, right? Um, now, 1B basically advertises it using, I don't know, we'll have a different color. Let's go purple, okay? It advertises this reachability to 2A, but it doesn't send two advertisements. 1B says to 2A that 1B can reach this IP address, right? So the two advertisements kind of get combined at some points. Right. All right. Sorry if I belabored the point. No, no. It feels like you could... I mean, couldn't malicious, uh, with malicious intent, you just change your IP address to mimic or match something and then just advertise, you know, hey, this is that IP address, send me the information? Or am I thinking of this incorrectly? Yeah, yeah, you could. Um, someone, though, this router has to accept your advertisement. Okay. So what really happens is that um, there is there is a router here and there is a router here, right? And so you're advertising not from a server to a router in another AS, but really you are uh, advertising to a network that's running BGP and then there's a BGP advertisement going between AS. So there is some administrator here that says, I'm gonna advertise this. And there is some network administrator here saying, I'm gonna advertise this, right? And they are part of, an autonomous system, and these guys are part of autonomous systems, and so they're professionals where one AS will generally trust another. Gotcha, okay. But what could happen is you could start your own autonomous system, and you, if you bamboozle somebody to believing you're a legitimate AS, which I guess requires a lot of documents and things like that, but okay, presumably you could cross that barrier, and then you could say, I'm advertising for everything. <laughs> Right, and so everyone will say, "Great, I'm going to just send all my traffic to Jason." 
<laughs> right. And this is what happens when, you know, you have these stories about Pakistan stealing all the traffic for YouTube or Russia stealing all the traffic for Google, right? They're like legitimate enough ASs that people will trust them. But it turns out it's either some guy who's incompetent or, you know, the Russian government telling its network administrators, you know, to send out this BGP advertisement and then claim incompetence later. But, you know, they're stealing the traffic. How funny would that be? Yeah, if it was just one person who screwed up. And, no, and this is what like... happens. This is what happens. This wow. happened a whole bunch of times. There's like a guy that says, you know, misconfigures BGP and there's a black hole of internet for, for, for you know, a few hours. So someone calls them and be like, yo. <laughs> or basically until other people figure out it's a black hole and, and don't accept that advertisement anymore, right? Don't, don't propagate it. Um, yeah, is the thing. Okay, so a um, couple fun things to show you guys. So um, this is uh, a graph from Google Trends, which basically you can type in a keyword and see how popular it is, it is in search results. And so you can see that people have been searching for IP multicast way more, comparatively speaking, to the way they do now, right? So there's this decline in the interest in multicast. Uh, it starts in 2004 because that's when Google Trends uh, started tracking those types of things. And so this is definitely something that's on the decline. But you can see that multicast, which is on the decline here in blue, I guess I guess I could have made a blue line, um, is on the is on the decline. It has been replaced by things like MPLS, okay, and software-defined networks. Right? And so these technologies became more popular. Now they're becoming kind of less popular as they're becoming more of a standardized thing. And right? you can kind of see the replacement um, of, you know, as MPLS was a much more mature technology for a while, then it was being chased by software defined networks. Um, and now they're declining just because they're kind of becoming not the hot things, but sort of standard technologies. What's interesting though is uh, you can look at other technologies, for example, 5G. Right, same graph. It's just that there's such a popularity of looking at 5G solutions, right, that they completely spike. Um, and then as 5G is being deployed, right, people are like, okay, it's actually, it's still hot, but it's not as hot as it was here. And so when you're looking at kind of how networks are built, right, you can do these sort of high level searches to see, you know, what, what is it that are people, that people are investing in, what are the up and coming technologies? All right, and then I, that's what I think I have for you guys today. We'll start talking about stuff to define networks um, in our next lecture. Any uh, last minute questions? Uh, I had a question about um, some of the differences between multicast and anycast. Is, is it, am I understanding correctly that in multicast it's more of like a push kind of um, concept where like anycast it's up to the client whether the requests the information or so there not, differences yeah um okay any cast is really easy to explain any cast is basically uh attaching the same host or the same server at multiple points of the network with the same ip address and mm -hmm. then the client wants to send traffic to that ip address and the network figures out to which server that traffic that ip packet will be forwarded to um so you know, push pull doesn't matter. It's really just a just a just a method of um, um, the routing of IP packets. The concepts of push and pull are really application layer concepts, right? In terms of who's doing the request. Gotcha. Yep. When you talk about multicast, the key thing is um, this idea of group management, right? Where even before you have a flow. Um, you need to have a group membership be established. Once that group membership is established, that, that process ends up creating a spanning tree, which allows the delivery of packets along the spanning tree of, of, of the routers, among the routers. So Anycast delivers one packet on some short path to some destination, multicast establishes a spanning tree, which is then used to forward traffic to all the interested um destinations does that help 
Got it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of uh, sense. Thanks. So would an Anycast system be something similar to like on a, um, again, using video games, it's just what I know a little bit about. Yeah, um, sure. But would it be something like how they have servers that are you like, they have EU servers, they have US servers and stuff like that. And so you, they'll have similar, like, would they have the same IP address? And then you like kind of route accordingly based on like, you, I guess, cost. Yeah, you could do it that way. Um, because you can choose between servers, that tells me that they are actually uniquely identified. Um, so let me put it this way. If you, can uniquely, if you can uniquely identify or you can differentiate between a US server and a EU server, they're not in your any cast. That's fair. If, if you just have a server that you connect to and you don't know where it is, it is possible using any cast. OK, gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, great. I think this is time. So thank you, guys. And I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.